and it'll be the next thing, it'll be a fire through one of our fire grids, our electricity grids. Folks, just a couple of things, if I may, just to sort of, before we open God's word. First of all, you, a couple of weeks ago, I stood up here and I announced I was no longer an Australian, I was a Tongan, and uh, after yesterday, I'm now Kumulu. <laughs> if you watch the rugby league, the Kumulus beat the Great Britain Lions. Great to watch on TV with the local commentary, so that was just good stuff. The Goliath, David and Goliath stuff, it's just awesome. It's just great to get your head around that. We have our AGM coming up. It's been talked about. The nominations uh, have been put in and uh, we praise God for that. Just so you can pray more effectively on the notice board to the right up under uh, updates and events, there's a list on the left-hand side of the, of the positions that will be elected or voted on and then there's on the other side, there's those who are affirmed and appointed. They're in blue. So one's in red, one's in blue. Can you take a time just to walk past, have a look at those names so you can pray more meaningfully into that, please? Because we don't want to do things just ad hoc. We don't want to just sort of say, oh, yeah, we're doing this because this is what we always do. We want God's hand to be in the life of the church and the leadership of the church as we go forward. So I want to encourage you with that. And uh, lastly, just um, just speaking about the... The council, um, the Lord Merrill Carrolls that we're doing and participating in the Lockyer Valley Ministers Association as well is that we have a hundred flyers on the front table. Now Richard and I had a chat and we, you don't bet in churches, we don't bet. But he said, Doug, you know what's going to happen, you're going to talk about this and people are going to forget all about it. And he said, why don't you take him to church and hand him out? And I thought, I've got more faith in you guys than that. Not that you don't have faith in him, Richard but he knows humanity. So as you're going out of church today, we have flies for you to take and invite family and neighbours to. If you take two and put one in each neighbour's mailbox, just think of the lives that you may change because they will come along and have a great afternoon of kitty fun and all the things that are happening there and then inside sing carols and glorify God, get the message of Christmas and the understanding, as Luke said, the real message of Christmas, not the one we've made it, and then um, it changed lives. It'll change lives. So this piece of paper could change lives. And if you leave here without this piece of paper, you won't be able to change lives. No. <laughs> yes, Richard. Thank you, Richard. Thanks for reminding me. There's also, if you have neighbours who have, have seen and visual discern, we have A4 ones, okay? So you can put it in, they can open. Whoa, look at the size of this sucker. So we have A4 ones out there as well if you want to take those and put them up somewhere. So I encourage you to be involved in that. And... Uh, and just see what God's going to do. Excited about that? Now who's going? Let's see. Look at those. Wow, man. <laughs> Luke, weren't you depressed with only like four people put their hands up the last time? Oh, well. we'll just have to keep praying for you, guy. So to make sure you make it something there. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we open your word today, Lord, we've been singing about how great you are an everlasting God. Father, we thank you for your word that points us to that in so many ways. Father, it just brings alive your nature, your character into our lives. Father, as we contemplate today's passage and Lord and, and look forward and through the above and beyond aspects of your effect in our lives and in the life of the world, Lord, just impress upon us our role in that. Lord, we expect to hear from you today as always. Father, I just thank you for the opportunity it is to share in your word. And Lord, we ask as always that your, Lord, the words I speak won't be mine, but your words indeed. Amen. Folks, when we have a look at God's word, and we've been doing a series about giving, about giving in worship and about the bounty of God and about how we can look into the potential and raise more than our potential up, he sees into our lives. And just a little add-on to that, and this is probably the last one that I'm going to speak about in this regard, is about being above and beyond expectations. The diaconate that we talked about on Monday night, when it came up that the Ministers Association were asking for donations from churches, the conversation started to go around, well, okay, we could give $50 because, yeah, that would be our portion, our, our, our aspect of it, our ratio. Or we could give more than that and point the glory to God. And it got me thinking about just what it likes to, it's like to live in God's presence and to be part of his kingdom and to be in a relationship with him. It's above and beyond all our expectations. It's above and beyond all that we could ever even perceive in our minds. And as we look through passages of Scripture today, I just want you to keep that rolling over in your head. 
that we can do great things for God that glorify his kingdom when we allow God to work in our lives. So if you want to open up your Bibles up to 2 Kings chapter 4. There's a great little account in there of Elijah and a widow. And um, as we read through, you'll see what I'm getting at here, just about how God can intercede and step in, and I pray he does that in your life. The wife of a man from a company of the prophets cried out to Elijah, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two sons away as slaves. Elijah replied to her, How can I help you? Tell me what to do. Sorry, sorry, tell me what you have in your house. Your servant has nothing at all, she said, except a little oil. And Elijah said, go around and ask all your neighbours for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into the jars and as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him and afterward shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her and kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. Then he replied, there is no more jars. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went out and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can now live on what is left. Folks, all through Scripture, all through Scripture, there's the language in Scripture is about God being above and beyond. And there's certain things that we come across there and he talks about, and Scripture talks about the inheritance that we have in Christ. Now, inheritance means that you have been left something in a will. It's above and beyond your expectation. It's outside of what your daily life is. There's just an added in comes in. And when we walk with God, that's what we have. We have an inheritance in the kingdom more than our minds can even handle. And we're part of that big picture. The Bible speaks about grace overflowing. We're going to speak about these a little bit in detail a bit later. But about God's grace that we don't deserve. And, gro- and through God's grace, he can he, he come into our lives and give us things we've never experienced before. And my heart went out this week when I heard the news of young Co- Cody Walde and about how through you know, the family circles and the tragedy of that young man's death that so many people were affected by it. And it got me thinking about, Lord, just, just need to be around these people. As Joe prayed before, Lord, just send comfort to them. Put people in there who can give them comfort and give them hope and just give them that assurance that even though there's a tragedy, that God is there. That's what good a God of grace does in our lives. The Bible talks about eternal life, to take it even one step further, and about how that's just not a life that's li- living today, but a life that goes on forever. And that's what God is about. The language of over and above, above and beyond, is not just a life, it's eternal life. Because it does, it goes beyond all our expectation. His love goes beyond all our expectation. Sometimes it's hard, if you're not used to being loved, it's hard to accept the love from God. And uh, we need to work our way through that sometimes as well. Folks, in this passage of Scripture, the widow has a dilemma. And I take into all those aspects of what we're talking about in Scripture. And the dilemma is that she had an immediate need. She had a need that had to be met. She had this terrifying circumstance where her sons were going into slavery. She called out to the only man of God she knew, and that was Elijah. There was a gap there that needed to be filled that only God could fill in her life. And it was a simple task to do. Someone might say even too simple. But in that time, if you had to go to your neighbours and ask for jars, uh, they needed jars as well because jars took so long to make. They were so labour intensive. It would have been a real generosity in the local community. And they gave her the jars and she went back and she followed the directions. And it says in God's word that she received more than she needed. She received enough to pay off the debtor and the creditor. She need, had enough to pay for her sons for their future. So what we don't understand in that context, it's not like today where you have a pension or you have allocation from the government. A widow is a widow. She was on her own. 
So basically all livelihood was cut off. Uh, sons would have to provide for her, and it sounds like her sons were too young yet to provide and look after her. So this was actually destitute times. This was actually critical times in the life of this widow, where she was about to go out onto the street with her two sons. And through her obedience and following what, the, what Elisha said, she received that abundance. God has demonstrated all through his word about his uh, going above and beyond. He moved a whole nation. He took all the Israelites, the Hebrews, and he took them out of Egypt, delivered them into freedom. They whinged and sucked and carried on all the way through the desert. He moved a whole nation. He held back a sea. And when you have a look at the geography of where that is believed to have taken place, that is no mean feat. It's not like paddling across low tide somewhere. There's a huge place there that the sea had to be parted in that part of the world. He fed the nations. A whole nation, he fed them with manna and quail. This is the God above and beyond. Fed them with manna and quail. And I did a bit of maths, and I'm not really good at maths, but I did a bit of maths, and I worked out that there was 603,500 miles 20 years and above. So you could probably multiply that by two. God fed 1.2 million people with manna and quail. Isn't that awesome? Is that God going above and beyond? No, 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 I don't think so. I've seen better. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? <laughs> yeah. I just was blown away when I saw that. I thought, oh, this is awesome. Three, 600,000. I went, oh, yeah, that's okay. God, that's pretty average. It's about like Queensland's population. Then I realised I had to multiply that. And then add on the little ones as well. It's probably more than 1.2 million people. God has a history of going above and beyond. And he wants that in our lives in a multitude of ways. He wants it in your life in a multitude of ways. And it keeps going. God doesn't give up on there. When we go through God's plan for the gospel, the same thing happens. Jesus says in Matthew 28, he says, go into the world and as you go, make disciples and bring them into the, into the kingdom of God and the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. I'll be with you to the end of the age. That's my paraphrase of that passage. But it says go into all the nations. It doesn't go into select nations or what you can. It doesn't say, well, go only as far as your tank of fuel will go or your donkey will last. He says go into all the nations. This is God going above and beyond. That's how his plan was for the gospel. And then we read in Acts that he says, well, just go as far as you think you can throw a rock. It says Judea, Samaria and the, and the ends of the earth. This is God going above and beyond. So not only did he demonstrate it with the Israelites, he, didn't he also demonstrated it with the widow, but he also demonstrated it with his gospel. And we are recipients of that gospel. If those guys had said, well, we can be limited only by what we have in front of us, we would not be sitting here today as a nation that has an opportunity to know God more deeply. And then we get down to the aspect of grace. Because not only are we a participant in all the above, we're a participant in the life of God for other things. In John 1, 16, it says these words. Out of his fullness, we all have received grace in place of grace already given. Out of, all, out of his fullness, we've all received grace. See, grace is one of those commodities that God just pours out onto us. In Romans 5, 17, for if it is... By the trespass of one man's death, death, one man, death reigned through one man. How much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace, of the gift of righteousness, reign in the life through one man, Jesus Christ? God's plan all along was that we, he was, had got grace to burn. And he wants you to receive that grace. He wants you to live in that abundant grace. And when we live in that abundant grace, we have eyes to see things we've never seen before. We have a perspective to look and to adjust and to get things into a place we can come into that place before God. And His grace is there for you to receive. All you have to do is acknowledge it. In Romans 5.20, God ups the ante a bit. And I, 
As I was reading this, I was just, the law was brought in so that trespass may increase, but where sin increases, grace increases more. You ever feel like you just the world's just had it? And you think, what's going on? All the way, all the time, God is saying, my grace is greater than this. No matter what you see in the world today, you turn on the TV and the news is destruction, and I'm not talking about the bushfire, I'm just talking about humanity pulling itself apart. The bushfires are something else again that we just need to pray God's grace into. Is that He has grace for everyone. There's grace for you to receive. That is part of His whole mission, as a part of the way He has designed things. And through Jesus, we receive it even greater. And in Ephesians 1 7 says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with His riches of God's grace. God is phenomenal. Through Jesus Christ, his son, that he sent, we have grace. We have it above and beyond what we deserve, above and beyond of what we can even contemplate. And that leads us to eternal life, which is, part of, which is the mission of Jesus for speaking to us today in 21st century Gatton, in our first world country. In John 3.16, it says that God so loved the world that he sent his only son, that all should believe in him shall have eternal life. If you're going to do something to the extreme, God's only son, your one only choice, the one you have, you send that. That's above and beyond. If you go up, up town and you have a look at the Weeping Mothers Memorial, you see names up there, lists of families of sons that went to war. And you know there was an age limit to go to war? But some of the guys lied. Some went when they were 16. They didn't have a computer to check you on those days. You had to take it your word. Families were wiped out. Their futures were wiped out because all the sons went and sacrificed for their country. Then you could understand if you were in that family's boots. That's how God felt. He wanted us to understand that, that his son can pay for our sin, but that was his commitment to us above and beyond is to go that extra mile up the ante and through Jesus Christ we can receive that eternal life. When I was teaching athletics, I was teaching athletics that I used to t train 800 meter runner, 200 meter runners. I remember going down to the tracks at Apex Park with beautifully prepared uh, turf sort of grass oval there that was metic meticulously maintained. And I used to set up the markers around there after school for my pot of athletes that I was training. And they were all sort of, you know, grades sort of six and seven in those days. That was seven was the top of primary school. They're all pretty full of themselves. So, you know, we're gifted athletes. And I used to say, okay, we're going to start training. I used to say we, but figuratively them. I used to say, we're going to have a bit of a look at this. I said, so you guys want to run 200 metres. Well, 200 metres is a sprint. So you need to have the wind, you need to have the aerobic capacity to be able to get through 200 metres. And so I said, we're not going to run 200 metre shuttles, we're going to run 800 metre shuttles. And they thought I was joking. And so we went out there and we said, okay, here's the starting line, worked it out, it's two laps of the oval, off you go. And, we'd ru and they'd run and they'd do it on time trial for me and we'd get their times down and down over a period of the training season. Folks, when they came to run the 200 metres, they just started and went bang and they just ran. And they got across the finish line and some of them were only just puffing. And, you know, they appreciated, they said, that training. Because we have to think about it in terms that it's more than what we need to do. We need to go that further above and beyond. And when you train above and beyond, when you expect to go above and beyond, then you have the capacity to do what's in front of you. And part of this understanding about walking with God and even in eternal life is about how that multiplies in our life. See, it isn't about subtraction, it's about multiplication. And everyone who has left their houses or brothers or sisters or mothers or fathers or wives or fields, for my sake, said Jesus, receives a hundred much more than they will in, in inherit in eternal life. Because of that sacrifice, because of that putting that little one there and that situation there, they can step out in a greater way. How does that sit with you? Do you experience that in your life? Is there something holding you back from... Do, are you just doing 200-metre shuttles or are you doing multiplications of that? 
Are you able to grasp what God has planned is for your life? That is always a challenge for us all. It's not just some people, it's for everyone. We all have that challenge in our life. It's the Father's will in John 6, 40. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life and I will raise them on the last day. Such is God's commitment that He just put it out there, that's all you've got to do. And in, in Ephesians 1, 7 to 9, it says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sin, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that He begrudgingly gave us, that He lavished upon us. Folks, we can look at um, prosperity many ways. We can look at it purely as the world does in dollars and cents. We can look at it in spiritual sense. But we fit upon something today, just talking in the whole service, and that is about making God famous. It's about doing what we can as our role in the kingdom and our expectation to experience God going above and beyond and making God famous. A few weeks ago, Chappie Doug up at the high school organised the teacher's day morning tea so celebrating teachers so we went up to the high school and we took along our portions to put into them into the coffers and there was an abundance of food those teachers were best blessed above and beyond there was so much tucker there it looked really good and as they came in for their staff meeting with um, principal cook and they were sitting there and listening to things they were all lying off the food waiting for the the get ready set go button so they go in and sink a fang do you know Afterwards, the comment that came back through several sources to us as pastors was, I, it's just so good to see churches all working together. I thought they hated each other. I don't know what you've been saying, Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> That's about making God famous. People who came together, we put our mega portion in, everyone put their mega, but through that abundance, it spoke to the people and encouraged those teachers no end. And I just praise God for that opportunity. We talked about inheritance, we've talked about grace. Uh, we talked about, sorry, we talked about eternal life, we talked about grace. Let's talk about the life of the church. His bride. That is what we are. We're part of, it says in the Bible, the bride of Christ is the church. I heard a pastor the other day talk about the churches and he's saying, you know, as pastors we view churches in different ways. He said, he said not all churches are pretty to work with. He said, some brides aren't that attractive. <laughs> but you love them anyway. And um, I just thought that was a great way to look. At, I don't think you're ugly, by the way. <laughs> you're beautiful. <laughs> Does that sound convincing? Okay, good. But this is what is called upon the people in the members of the church, the participants of the church, the bride of Christ. The first one is to use spiritual gifts, to simply serve. In Romans 12.8, it says this, if it is to encourage, then let their gift be encouragement. It's got a whole list of, of gifts there, but I'm just focusing on a couple. If it is giving, let them give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. Do you get the theme here? If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. It's not just do that, but do it better. It's not just participate here and say, oh, I'm doing this, but actually do it better so that more people benefit. More people are encouraged. More people receive generosity. More people are cheered up with your mercy. The role of the bride of Christ, the role of the church, is not to do things just as they are, but to do them above and beyond. That's what we're called to do. And that's why sometimes it's so hard, because we're so reserved. And some, we just need to release ourselves to God in that way, and use our spiritual gifts. It needs to build, our gifts need to build up the church, not tear it down. See, building up is actually going above and beyond. Could you imagine if it just happened this way, is that, we decided that we're going to plant a church. So we find somewhere around the valley to plant a church. And we go and we plant a church. Keep this one going, plant another church. Okay, and what we're doing is we go and we mow the grass and we put a cross there and we walk away. And that's it. And so we said, yep, we've planted a church. But if we, unless we attend, unless we encourage others to attend and to help to grow that body, that's just going to stay a wooden stick in the field. 
We are called to do more than just come and just participate. We're come to do and build up the church. In 1 Corinthians 14, 12, it says, So it is with you, since you are, e- you are eager for gifts of the Spirit, try to excel in those that build up the church. Try to use your gifts in those that build up the church. In 2 Corinthians, it talks about reflecting God's heart. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, in all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. There's an abundance there. It just keeps adding on to that above and beyond. And lastly, we don't do these things to make ourselves look good. The comment that was made to the teachers in the staff room was, wow, the churches look great. But that we know that points to the glory of God. On Saturday night, it's not about people up there singing and performing. It's not about the choirs coming and mum and dad's feeling proud. It's about making God famous. It's about lifting God in the community, about letting people understand God more clearly. Because God has a personal journey for each person. It's not going to look the same to each of us. But the bottom line is, he wants it to be above and beyond anyone's expectations. And I just want to encourage you with that, to look at that in a different way perhaps and to just ex- receive what God is saying there. The last one I'm going to talk about is just inheritance. And, and with, this la- with the widow uh, talking about in 2 Kings is that there was no inheritance for her. Inheritance were in her sons and her sons were to grow up and provide for her as in the culture. And by receiving and going through that miracle, if you want to use those words, that miracle of the oil, it provided a way for her to have an inheritance for her sons. We are part of that inheritance as well. Again, Scripture speaks about God's great love. In 1 John 3, it says, See what great love that God has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Sometimes that's hard. But if, could you imagine, if who's got siblings? Okay. There's more hands up for siblings, Luke, than people going, so... To the thing. I just want to point that out there. Everyone's got siblings. Put your hand up if you get along so well with your sibling you've never had a fight in your life. <laughs> oh. All right, I'm just going to change my notes now. We're God's children and we get along, sort of, don't we? We have fights because that's what families do. They just can't, there's something there with a sibling rivalry or whatever it is. But we are part of God's family. And we are part of his inheritance. And what we need to think about is that if we're going to be children of God, we've got to think about how can we act as children of God? How can we participate as children of God? My dad used to stand on the sidelines when I was playing football. And he used to yell out, go Douglas, smash him. And he used to yell this this really weird thing, now Douglas, now. I have no idea what that meant. But he used to yell it out and everyone was, he was so enthusiastic and so loud, even my teammates used to turn to me and say, well, Douglas, do something. And I said, I don't know what the old, I don't know what the old man's talking about. <laughs> he was cheering me on from the sidelines like God cheers us on. And he's saying, church, my children, go do it above and beyond. I'm proud of you guys. Get out there and have a crack. That's what it's about. It's about going above and beyond and God just going, yay, team. He'll yell out, now, Patrick, now. And Patrick will go, what? <laughs> That's okay, Patrick. The word in, the Greek word for inheritance translate as participation in privileges. So when it says we're inheritance in the kingdom of God, we're participating in the privilege of the kingdom of God. And that's pretty special. It doesn't actually just mean give me money or where's my share. It actually means participating in the privileges of the kingdom of heaven. In 1 Peter 1, 4 it says, And into the inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, this inheritance is kept in heaven for you. Do you you, Is that part of who you're thinking? Do you understand you have an inheritance in heaven that's just for you? It's just about you. God has set aside for you to participate in the privilege of heaven just for you. In Hebrews 9.15, it says, For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, 
that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. E eternal inheritance, wow. All who are called may receive. Some people believe that they should just rock up to any old reading of the will and get the inheritance. They've never had anything to do with the great-uncle's life or the great-grandfather's life or the great-grandmother's life. They just believe that, oh, yeah, there's a solicitor and there's some people. I'll go stand there and see what I can get. Part of the kingdom of God is that commitment, is to walk in step with God, is to acknowledge God in your life and say, okay, God, what do you got for me to do here? How can I participate in your kingdom to the fullest above and beyond of what you've blessed me with? Worship team, if you'd like to come up, we're going to finish up now. And, and um. So folks, I've asked you to take two flyers. If you want to go above and beyond, take three. And find three people to invite. If you're wondering, well, is there something I can do for the kingdom of God? Perhaps it might be just go above and beyond your own nervousness and just talk to your neighbour and just say, G'day, how you going? There might be something as simple as that. So when we have a look at the, the above and beyond approach of God, we've talked about it, that history testifies about that God doesn't just do things by halves, he does them above and beyond. We know that through the widow's example, obedience is essential, listening to God and following what he says. It's not rocket science. We know that we read in Scripture, his love knows no bounds. It has love for everybody. We also read in Scripture and we understand that you can experience it personally. And lastly, the generosity is kingdom-centred. Having a generous spirit in all aspects of your life is kingdom-centred. It's not about big-noting ourselves. It's not about making the best church in Gatton. It's not about our faith. It's about our personal walk with God and receiving that generosity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks, Lord, that when we sing songs with the words everlasting God and mighty God. They speak, Lord, of, of your above and beyond nature. Father, for this week ahead, and Lord, leading into this time of year as well, into Christmas and all the things that happen there, Father, just remind us through your spirit what it means to live in relationship with you, Lord, to walk with you, to experience that abundance of love and grace and that inheritance you've given for us when we acknowledge you as Lord and Saviour. Lord, it really does just humble us. And Father, we pray that, Lord, as we go through this next week, Lord, just help us to spend time with you. Lord, just a few minutes a day, even, just to find that solitary place where we can just acknowledge you in our lives. Lord, just listen to your voice. Father, we thank you for your blessing and your grace that's in abundance for us in your name. Amen.